Hello, I'm Natalia Dutra, an assistant professor at the Universidade Federal do Pará and one of the founders of Fabri. And I'm here today to introduce you to Big Team Science in Open Science from my perspective and some of my colleagues. These are my main talking points, most of which are based on a paper that's coming out soon. But it's also being posted as a preprint. It's called The Benefits, Barriers and Risks of Big Team Science. And it was led by Patrick Forscher, who's also one of the speakers in this event. Actually, we have several of these uh, of these papers authors at this event. And we are a bunch of people with different levels of expertise and coming from different places in the world, in the same way that myself and the other founders from Abri are. The rest of this talk's content is a bit of a personal touch that I'll add to the mix. So today I'm going to talk about uh, what is open science and in this context, context what is big team science some of the benefits and challenges of big team science and why having a diverse and inclusive open and big team science is important. So first things first, if you don't know already, I'll introduce, to, uh, I'll introduce you to open science by using the term open scholarship, which is brought up by several open science adopters and it is an umbrella term that includes several practices under it. What all these have in common is that they aim for practices and products that are transparent, under, uh, transparent and free, uh, freely available for use, reuse, uh, remixing and sharing. In this context, uh, open often modifies another term, such as open source or open access, implying difference from a conventional, closed or non-transparent approach. So I'm bringing this definition from the Open Source Alliance, and one aspect that is very appealing to me uh, in the way this group defines open science and other open uh, practices is the way they encourage the community to question it. So when we talk about open, and especially about open science, we have to talk about uh, a, whether uh, for whom it's open, uh, for what is open, and for which purposes is open, and why it's open. And I believe we all agree, uh, especially the founders of Abri, of Abri that there is no open science if science is not open to all. And this is a quote from Whitaker and Guest uh, in 2020, when they, where they discuss uh, in a piece the, the fact that open science is not naturally a place for uh, inclusiveness, inclusiveness and uh, diversity if we don't work to promote it. If you're a little bit like me, this can feel a little too overwhelming at, at first, if you're not familiar with it. So I bring my favorite metaphor for open science, which is the buffet one, in a talk of Christina's Bergman advice uh, about open science became famous, where she recommended we not try to stuff ourselves on everything, uh, select what works best for us, uh, and steadily improve our views. And I'll come back to this uh, later, but it's important to bear that in mind. So far, so good, but we are still in the realm of individuals here and how individual scientists do science and perform in academia. However, the system has been proved uh, unsustainable and problematic for some things. And I'll introduce you first to the definitions of big team science and small team science that we work with. Uh, and from the start, from the start uh, I 
have to emphasize that big team science is not supposed to replace small team science, but rather it complements it. Because small team science is not enough. Um, so big team science is, as defined in the paper I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, a method involving a relatively large number of collaborators who may be dispersed across large institutions, disciplines, cultures, and continents. And we can contrast this with small team science, which is usually organized around a single principal investigator in their dependent trainings. The big issue with the typical psychological study and that extends to people doing typical studies, even if they adopt open science practices, is that uh, there, are, there is insufficient resource investment, uh, regardless of where you look at the problems with doing uh, a study, what it is, because it, it lacks uh, some expertise, it lacks a, sample, a set of sample size, it has some biases, it always uh, boils down to the fact that even if that uh, researcher wanted to prove on, um, on their skills or on their practices, they may end up running into uh, the insurmountable difficulties and that involve uh, material uh, personal, uh, not the word personal, intellectual resources, sorry. Um, so in the end, we don't have enough money, people or specialized expertise for one specific study. Uh, so do you remember the buffet approach that I mentioned? Uh, a lot of the discussions on open science have, have been revolved around uh, which priorities should the researcher take? Should they focus on increasing their sample or learning better for more modeling and developing sophisticated statistical skills, uh, taking steps to be transparent across all their research workflow, asking which questions are worth answering, uh, which studies should be replicated, etc. Uh, all of this while struggling to keep up with the pressure for publications. So these decisions involve, usually involve trade-offs where a researcher alone, uh, an individual researcher needs to choose where they will uh, focus their efforts while also um, lacking in other uh, aspects of uh, the research uh, process. Since resources, of course, are uh, feet. When it comes to big team science, we can shift uh, the discourse. And instead of asking which aspects of uh, study rigor ought to be prioritized, uh, we can ask how can we increase the resources invested in psychological studies in a certain that extra investment is used efficiently. This is not me saying that. This is, uh, it's uh, the argument that we proposed in the paper. And other people have been saying it better than I can, but arguing better than I can. But the main point of this is that instead of working uh, isolated in our own individual labs, we can actually join uh, forces combine our material and intellectual resources to produce a better uh, and improved version of these uh, studies. So we propose that we can either try to first uh, directly change the institutional incentives that prioritized mainly the quantity of publications in, uh, in high-impact journals. And this is not a discussion that I'm going to have here.
here, but we're gonna have a session where we talk about publications and publication practices. Uh, but we can also and or uh, devise new institutions, which we call big team science, uh, big team science organizations that allow blocks of scientists to increase the resource investments in concept. We can actually focus on the second point and through that, do work that will force these institutional changes uh, in the first point, in my opinion. Uh, of course, this is not an easy work to do. And one of the purpose of, purposes of ABRI and this event is try to uh, work which barriers uh, exist for underrepresented researchers and uh, under-resourced researchers to join and lead in big team science uh, initiatives in these organizations as well. Uh, and also how can we uh, offer training, offer tools, and also uh, propose new projects uh, together in the context of big team science and open science. So to end the first point, uh, we believe that the primary and most definition, definitional function of a big team science organization is to allow larger investments of material and intellectual resources in a given project. So when we have a large group of people, all of us can actually invest in the same project uh, and share the risks and share our, our different expertises, expertises uh, to make that project happen instead of, again, working isolated and uh, concentrating all the risks and all the potential uh, costs that we have, uh, investing all the resources that we have in all the potential uh, uh, issues that we have to deal with in a particular project. Um, so how we do that, while, how we do that or while also striving to be more representative of human diversity is uh, one of the topics of this event. So the second point that I'm going to address today are the benefits and barriers of Big Ten Science. Uh, of course, we believe that Big Ten Science can bring uh, several benefits. The first one, I already mentioned it, is that we can have larger investments of material and intellectual resources in a project but we can also centralize many aspects of project administration in one organization, so uh, a place or a system that allows us for some teams to centralize the aspect of the project administration uh, that otherwise would be all uh, uh, forgot the word, sorry all these aspects of would be the responsibility of one researcher. In that case, we have this organization taking care of this, uh, this aspect of the project organization. Also, the a big team science organization uh, allow individ allows individual researchers to specialize into roles that match their skills instead of having them uh, occupying all roles uh, in a big team science uh, organization. You can actually allow individuals to take on hold, take up on roles where they can have, they can use, if they are good, uh, great on daily skills, they can focus on that. If they're great on managing, managing teams, they can focus on that. If they are good on translation processes, they can focus on that, and etc. We also, a big team science project also uh, provide access to an expansive community, reduces intellectual isolation and provide access to professional opportunities. I'm the living proof of that. I have, I've had access to professional 
uh, opportunities and as in collaborations because of my work in uh, in big team science projects not necessarily on research which uh, takes me back to the the previous point previous point on um, you should not necessarily focus on um, being good in everything uh, to have your expertise uh, needed for such projects and uh, last but not least uh, researchers can become political actors within the broader uh, scientific ecosystem and this is something that I've been saying to I used to say actually uh, in my first talks in Brazil about open science which is uh, of course we should be pragmatic on how uh, open science can help us stay in our, in our careers but I was always um, I was always attracted to the side of uh, open science and in this case big team science as well I, I was always attracted by the, the how we can use that as a political tool to change things inside academia So even when you don't expect it to be doing that, you end up doing that because a lot of things that we do in this context is very different. In the, this context, sorry, is very different from the way we are used to work in small team science projects. Right. Um, of course, there are barriers to big team science. And for our paper, we need to find uh, that the three main barriers for big team science to be successful were related to incentives, infrastructure, and institutions. The first one refers to how we can incentivize labor within these collaborations. So of course, we, uh, we want to improve science, we want to wish to work together, uh, and, but there are also uh, all the uh, pressures in our work, especially in our jobs as scientists. So how do we uh, incentivize people to join us in big team science projects? So this is one of the barriers for that. And one of the potential solutions are changing how we attribute authorship. Because unfortunately, uh, for better or worse, uh, the publications are still how, uh, the way how many scientists are rewarded and promoted in academic institutions uh, in several places around the world. There are two ways of attributing authorship when you are in a big team science project. One of them is the consortium authorship, where uh, a group is the author of the, the study. Or if we happen to publish a study in, on PSA and we chose to publish it as the Psychological Science Accelerator instead of adding the authors to that. We don't do that, we, but we could do that. So instead, uh, what we do is we use the contributorship system, which is more appealing to me personally. I like the idea of contributorship, which is, it sees the paper as the end product of a long process. So, and anyone who contributed to this process, we call it like the research workflow, the research process, they are added as authors to the paper because they contributed to their project in some way. 
during this slide I show a snapshot of the credit taxonomy, which is, I think, the most famous um, contributorship model that we, we use nowadays, uh, where we have 14 contributor roles and we describe in the paper which roles each author had in the paper. Of course, there, there are limitations to that approach as to any approach to ownership and uh, credit. And the, the, the group who proposed credit is uh, revised, uh, reviewing the, the taxonomy, has been reviewing the taxonomy recently uh, and they want a lot of input from the research community about that, if I'm not mistaken. Regarding infrastructure, uh, of course we have an issue uh, that we don't, we, we still need to develop and maintain infrastructure to coordinate team science activities and um, the Psychological Science Accelerator and the Center for Open Science are two initiatives that help with that. Uh, we also nowadays have the internet and some tools that were recently developed to, developed to allow for um, remote work and we use that for our benefit. So the use of platforms such as Google Meet, uh, Zoom and other uh, team uh, managing uh, tools, uh, Slack for example, which we are using for our meeting as well, and uh, all, the, all of these help us to um, coordinate team science activities. So these are some of the solutions for that infrastructure problem, and as a curiosity, I always like to tell the story that uh, CERN, which, which was the consortium that was created by uh, particle physicists to um, so that they could collaborate in uh, particle physics uh, around the world. So it's one of the earliest examples, in my opinion, of big team science. So CERN was created after the Second World War, World War, and uh, they had to, to, they applied for money, they got money to build uh, the particle accelerator, and also they built the necessary infrastructure for them to collaborate with other academics all around the world big team science projects in physics and one of the things that they created that helped them sharing a research uh, faster and also helped us all at the end was the world wide web so the world wide, the world wide web was created so that science could be shared uh, openly shared uh, between those scientists so we are thankful to them because that's uh, why we can, uh, it's one of the reasons we can hear, be here today uh, talking about big team science. And it was an issue, it was an issue of infrastructure. Finally, we have the issue of institutions that are primarily designed to deal with uh, research conducted by smaller teams uh, led by a PI. And uh, we, to our knowledge, we don't really have any uh, potential solutions to that. Uh, we are uh, making them up as we go along, as I, as I like to say. Of course, that doesn't mean there aren't any. Uh, open science is a huge movement and there are many things are happening really fast in different places, at different places. So. There might be 
potential solutions to that that we are not aware of. Running towards the end of my talk, I just would like to add a personal touch on diversity and inclusion. I hope I'm not uh, discouraging you on joining Open Science and Big Team Science. It's tough, but uh, I believe it's, uh, it's the only way out of the issues that we have nowadays with uh, tradition, the traditional way of doing science, especially in psychology. One of the things that we learn when we are studying culture and how humans uh, have a unique sort of culture is that uh, we are capable of creating innovations and spreading uh, these innovations in our groups. And uh, so we do create culture by creating and adopting innovation. Innovations, learning, spreading, and stabilizing them in our groups within and across generations. A famous model that explains that, I, it was proposed to explain that, it, and I'm using here only as a metaphor, is the innovation adoption life cycle proposed by Rogers, where he proposes that there is a small number of innovators in a population that where they when they where they by mistake or by genius or something they create something new and then they they uh, introduce an innovation into a population there is a small group uh, is a slightly higher uh, a slightly larger group of earlier early adopters of these innovations and then these innovations spread to the majority and there are the laggards, which are the people who adopt these innovations uh, lately. I would like to ask you to reject a little bit, just for now, this model of innovation because it relies on an individualistic idea of how humans innovate. So I'm going to say that one of the pitfalls of this model is the focus on individuals. So this idea of some individuals that are maybe special or very uh, smart or maybe just, as I said, but by sheer luck or mistake, they introduce something new to the group and then the others alone by themselves figure the things out until that innovation is adopted by everyone else and I'd like you to ask to think about um, humans as more of uh, an species that work better in interactive and collaborative contexts so we know that special kinds of innovations happen in humans in those uh, contexts where we have recombination of practices and uh, conflicts that lead to more uh, to different and innovative things. To end, I'd like to uh, say that uh, the ideas of community, a supportive community, uh, equality, diversity and inclusion are good for a lot of things and I'm not saying that uh, just uh, for moral purposes although that would be good as well but uh, we know from science uh, scientific studies in psychology that more diverse groups that have partial connectivity and exchange of idea and resources that is good for learning, for knowledge production, for science and for human culture evolution. That does not preclude uh, in the 
quality and exploration itself themselves we need to work harder to uh, prevent them but uh, we know that uh, in the when we have those together uh, human beings uh, thrive so I'd like to end with this message and I also believe that victim science can be and victim science organizations can be the, the place where we can work to have uh, environments where we can uh, let uh, human beings thrive uh, in the context of uh, science and knowledge production. So I'd like to thank you all to listen to my for listening to my talk. Obrigada a todos. Have a good day.